This is episode 420 of Monster Kid Radio, the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. I'm your writer, host, producer, Derek M. Cook, and I want to send a huge thanks to the band Beach Masters of the Universe. They allowed us to play their music on this episode of the show. The song that you're hearing right now is Ruling in Tajikistan. It is from their album Tropica. You can find them at beachmasters.bandcamp.com or follow the link in the show notes when you're done listening to this episode of the podcast. We are still celebrating Lucha de Mayo here on the show. That's right. Every May, we talk about luchador genre films. And this time around, I'm joined by Jonathan Inbody from the X Meets Y podcast. And we're going to talk about a movie that's not exactly monster-centric, but it's still genre enough to be included during Lucha de Mayo, and that movie is Santo vs. Blue Demon in Atlantis. Yeah, this one's an interesting one, and Jonathan picked it, so we'll, we'll see what happens when we get into it. Okay, spoiler, it's a lot of fun, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in depth with Jonathan, as well as catching up with him, seeing what he's up to, and a few other things that will come up, I'm sure, along the way, up to and including a reference to Captain America Winter Soldier. Trust me. Also this week, we've got not one, not two, but three segments. Right, we've got the entire party here. Well, almost. We don't have a weird Wednesday, but I'll get into that here in a little bit. We've got Professor Frenzy's Bedtime Story, presented by Jerry Green. Big thanks to Jerry for making that part of the show. We also have Dr. Tongue's World of Monster Collectibles, or Dr. Tongue's World of Monster Collectibles. I can't do it like he can. Plus, we have Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We're going to continue our voyage through that iconic magazine talking about Mexican horror movies. And, you know, one of the icons, one of the patron saints of Monster Kid Radio gets brought up. Who is it? Well, you're just going to have to stay tuned to find out. I've got all that, plus the current round of the Monster Movie Madness Tournament is still underway. There's still time for you to vote in that. Head over to tinyurl.com slash mmmadness2019 to place your vote in this round. I believe we're in round four right now, and you know we had over 100 votes in round three. I want to hit at least that amount in round four. It's getting tight, and some of these choices are tough, but... I know you guys and gals can handle it. You're also going to hear some trailers this time around, maybe a few promos. Yes, I'll probably drop a promo for my book into the mix again because it's still for sale. And we're going to get to all of that right after this. Coming back. back. Creatures Con, the Bay Area's classic horror convention, returns to the San Ramon Marriott Sunday, July 7th, with spine chilling special guests. Hammer horror legend Veronica Carlson, star of Dracula Has Risen from the Grave and Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, with director Joshua Kennedy attending the West Coast premiere of their newest feature film, House of the Gorgon. Plus, Twin Peaks stars Charlotte Stewart, horror host legend John Stanley, and many, many more. But that's that's not not all. all. You'll see unique Creatures Con programs like the Monster Movie Quiz and Mega Chiller Theater. You'll shop our dealer's room filled with scary, fun, monstrous merchandise. All this and more at Creatures Con, the Bay Area's classic horror convention, Sunday, July 7th at the San Ramon Marriott. For tickets and info, go to CreaturesCon.com. Rocket into outer space with the heroic astronauts daring to explore beyond the moon, beyond the outer limits of human adventure, beyond the barrier of human credibility. Fighting the unknown forces and secret terrors science couldn't predict. There's a monstrous thing aboard this station. From the moon. That's what killed Weber. What kind of a monstrous thing? (laughs) 
discover the monstrous horror from the moon, threatening to destroy everything it touches. The fiendish force that ignited the loves, the hates, the passions of the explorers in space. Oh, Gordon, I miss you so much. It's so lonely out here. Well, all these men around? Don't no, tease me, not now. The awesome adventure of the astronauts of Space Station X-7, the journey that controlled the destiny of the world. Suppose that space station gets out of control. Suppose it plunges toward Earth, carrying that deadly thing with it. Well, it should burn up when it hits the atmosphere. Yes, it should, but suppose one tiny fragment didn't. The space age drama from tomorrow's headlines. The suspense, the drama, the terror of human beings facing a fiendish monster from the moon. Too incredible to believe, too gigantic to control, too mysterious for man to comprehend. This is mutiny. In outer space. Professor Friends, it's a show. Professor Friends, a show. Professor Friends, it's a show. Professor Friends, a show. Welcome to Professor Frenzy's Bedtime Stories, created especially for Monster Kid Radio. My name is Jerry Green. In this segment, I'm going to tell you some stories contained in the EC Horror Comics. Today's story is Terror Train. It is from the Vault of Horror No. 12, the April-May issue from 1950. It was written by Bill Gaines and Al Feldstein, and the art was by Al Feldstein. So sit back, relax while I tell this mysterious story. A woman named Gloria decided to leave her husband, Ralph. She believed that he was trying to kill her. She caught him hiding a jar of poison, and at one point, she noticed some of the poison was missing, so she saved herself by not eating for some time. She took a cab to the train station, bought a ticket, and hid behind a newspaper in case Ralph was following her. She recalled that one time she woke up to find Ralph standing over her with a knife, that he claimed he found on her night table. He was surely going to murder her. Finally, she was able to board the train. Before it pulled out of the station, Gloria thought she saw Ralph on the platform. Did he board the train? Was it really him? She couldn't say for sure. It was too late for her to get off the train, so she went to the public club car to get a drink to calm her nerves. She thought she saw Ralph in the mirror behind her. She gasped his name but it was someone else. She excused herself and went to another part of the train and sat in another seat so Ralph wouldn't find her. She remembered the time that Ralph bought a $25,000 life insurance policy. Surely he wanted to kill her for the insurance money. The conductor came by looking for her ticket, which he had left in her other seat. She went back to the sleeper car and got the ticket for him. She decided that the person she saw couldn't have been Ralph and decided to get some sleep. In the night, she was awoken by what she thought was a scream. Or maybe it was the train whistle. She couldn't be sure. She got up and looked in the porter berth. As she opened the curtain, she saw his hideous dead body. Then she went to another berth. There too was a dead body. All of the people were dead. She heard the screech of the brakes. The train came to a stop. She took advantage of the stop train to escape out into the countryside. She came upon a little cabin with a pit the size of an empty grave dug in front. She knocked on the door and the door opened. It was Ralph. He forced her into a coffin and nailed it shut and buried her in the hole in the yard. Gloria screamed and screamed. Suddenly, she awoke to a blinding light. She was sleeping in her berth on the train. There was a man in white telling her to be quiet. She had been dreaming. But with the man in white was Ralph. She said that Ralph wanted to kill her, and the man in white took her with him where Ralph couldn't hurt her. A group of men in white took her to a place where she would be protected from Ralph, with bars on the windows. Now she is safe. The end. 
I hope you enjoyed that tale of madness. The question this issue raises is, is Gloria really crazy? Or has Ralph driven her crazy by threatening to kill her? Or is it all in her mind? She's definitely paranoid about him coming after her and even mistakes another person for him. But if he's not after her, how did he get onto the train at the end? And if he is after her, is it because she needs mental help? He just wants to help her. Or is it because he's trying to finish her off? It's all very intriguing. In this case, the mystery and the unclarity makes the story richer for me. I'm looking for clues in the panels, but nothing is for certain. Though, for the second week in a row, we get the story of a crazed woman on her way to a mental hospital. These two stories were back-to-back in that issue of Vault of Horror, so it is like there's a theme to this issue. In my view, it's more than a little misogynistic, showing women as hysterical and unable to control themselves. I'd say it was a sign of the olden times, but we see similar things in current horror. Feldstein's art is effective. Gloria is drawn as a beautiful, well-kept woman. She luxuriates in her sleeping compartment in a little nightgown. Her hair is well-styled and her clothes look fashionable. Because she looks well put together, we don't think she's crazy until the end. In her dreams and recollections of Ralph, he's portrayed as either furiously angry or sleazy. But when we see him in the real world, he seems pretty normal. How much of Gloria's memories are delusions, we don't know. The final panel depicts Gloria standing under a harsh overhead light. Her face is in shadows. Her feet are bare. There are bars and grates over the window. She's in a cell in the mental institution. And the corresponding words show her as feeling safe. All in all, this is really good storytelling. Having the words and images combine to present a complex tale. Which makes sense as Feldstein worked on the story and the art. If you're interested in a copy of The Vault of Horror, Volume 1, the book can be purchased on Amazon, and you can find a link to buy it on the MKR website. I hope you enjoyed the story. My name is Jerry Green, and you can find me on my podcast, The Professor Frenzy Show, where we talk about new indie comics, and Bat Books for Beginners, where we talk about historical Batman and Bat Family comics. You can also catch me on Twitter, at Professor Frenzy, and search for Professor Frenzy on YouTube, where you can find the Professor Frenzy show and some very exciting projects we have coming up. Stay tuned, and thanks for listening. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. Hey man, dig this real gone show for a crazy thriller. It's Monsters A Go Go. A horror thriller with the Go Go Beat. Live on stage from Hollywood. See the teenage Frankenstein. See. Help! I need somebody. Help! The Beatles mystically transformed. See Hollywood's golden Go Go girl, Pat Collins. See. <laughs> Ethereal materialization of 007 as James Bond. It's the kookiest and the spookiest. It's where the action is. See? Monsters a go go. Terror walks off the stage and into the audience. Free. Two for one pass to anyone who can sit through the entire show. And it's all live. This is the only show that gets away with murder. So come early and get a seat. If you're late, we may put you in a coffin. See? Monsters a go go. Monsters a go go. Monsters a go go. Monsters a go go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jason Giaconetti. You may recognize my voice from the Vault of Starling Monster Horror Tales of Terror. And if you don't, you should be listening. But today I need to ask you a few questions. Do you like big bugs and you cannot lie? Other robots just can't deny that when the Queen of Space walks in and puts a blast in your face, that your gears get sprung? Are you deep in the bee we're sharing? Are you hooked and you can't stop staring? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then have I got a podcast for you. Bots, Bugs, and Babes, the Bee Movie Podcast. From classics to cults and all the yummy, yummy cheese in between. Look for my new show, Bots, Bugs, and Babes, on the Two True Freaks Network and on iTunes. That's Bots, Bugs, and Babes, the Bee Movie Podcast. Double J on the Triple B is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, you are now inside a time machine. 
We're about to take you 120 years into the future. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, In three, three seconds, you will be projected into the year 2087. The incredible becomes real as the time curtain is torn away to reveal the 21st century to your startled eyes in Cyborg 2087. You are an agent from the world of the future. Yes. The whole thing's insane. Cyborgs, time capsules. Doctor. It's incredible. But true, Dr. Zellin. This hand has the strength of five like this. Cyborg, half human, half machine, programmed to kill. Incredible, you say? Impossible, you think? Who knows what lies ahead? You could find out when you enter the fantastic world of Cyborg 2087. Radio presents Dr. Tongue's World of Monster Collectibles. Spanning the globe looking for monster goo so you don't have to. Dateline the internet. Well, I'm back after a brief hiatus and here's all the monster collectible news I have found that's fit to print. First up is new Mego Monster news. Coming in late June, keep an eye out for the new old assortment of five monsters from the new Mego Corp. The new, insert air quotes here, figures consist of a new reworked version of Dracula. Gone is the Lugosi likeness and insert a more Marvel Comics Dracula vibe. A glow-in-the-dark body, longer hair with goatee, widow's peak, purple cape, and all. Next up is a new Frankenstein's monster. This time he's ready for the beach and has gone shirtless. With a new muscular glow-in-the-dark body, ripped up pants, but that same dopey head sculpt. Also in the mix is a new fuzzy flocked werewolf figure, where they look to have just fuzzified the existing Wolfman figure that they've already released two times prior. The assortment rounds out with a new glow-in-the-dark Nosferatu with black coat and the same Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street, but supposedly in a limited release. Some rumors I have heard is that Mego has lost the distribution license for the character, whether it's the character license of Robert Edlund or the character of Freddy himself. Reports are speculative at this time. Super 7 is set to release their Universal Monster Keshi figures, and they should be hitting store shelves around the time you hear this. As I have previously reported, Keshi are small, detailed rubber figures that were made popular in Japan. Mattel had imported muscle figures in the 70s. They are a prime example of what a Keshi figure is. Anyway, Super 7 is releasing two different waves of the Universal Monster Keshis simultaneously. Each assortment has six different monsters in four different colors, and each pack includes a snazzy metallic monster sticker. Here's the catch. The assortments are blind packaged, so you have no idea which critter you're getting. No word yet on which monsters are in the assortment besides the creature and Dracula that are shown in the promo material. Also recently announced from Funko is a series of Universal Monster Minis, also blind boxed. Man! The 12 figure assortment includes two different Frankenstein monster, one with Daisy Flower and one without, a bride, two Draculas, one holding a candelabra and the other standing menacingly, the mummy sporting the scroll of life, two different invisible man figures. Wait, wouldn't that be invisible men? Eh. Dressed in a robe with a test tube, one bandaged head and one cast in clear plastic. Also, there's a creature, the Mole Man, and last but not least, the Claude Rains version of Phantom of the Opera, masked in his cape and hat. Of interest to you completists out there, there will be a black and white set exclusive to all Walgreens stores. These should be hitting the streets very soon. Artist Spotlight! happened upon this talented young man by accident one day while roaming around on Instagram. 
Looking over his profile pictures, I immediately fell in love with his quirky, goofy creations. Simply known on IG as The Real Bernhardt, we'll make sure that the link is put on the MKR page, he makes some very cool figural characters all monster kids can identify with. He simply started out by casting up, in resin, some monster soaky heads and inserting them on recast Cupid doll bodies. Add a dab of caveman animal print clothes and voila, art with a monster twist. Are you familiar with those Lucky Cat statues out of Asia? Well, he took one part Lucky Cat and one part monster, and once again, a monster thing of beauty is born. He has made Lucky Werewolves, Lucky Crimson Ghosts, Lucky Hedoras, as well as my favorite, the Lucky Green Slime. His latest creations involve figural robed bodies with skeletal hands painted in different color schemes with different heads attached. Just recently in his Store Envy store, isn't that kind of redundant? Uh, anyway, were falsy zombies, blind templars, and a nod to a classic vintage figural toy pencil sharpener, Greta the Ghoul. And yet another recent sculpt of his is a throwback to the keen big eye paintings from the 60s with his sad eyed, sorry Hedora figures. Try to wrap your imagination around that. Give his profile a follow on IG under The Real Bernhard or over at Store Envy under Real Horror Business Toys. You will not be disappointed. Spotlight on Vintage Monster Toys! A few weeks back, I ran through the fun little 3 and 3 quarter inch Universal Monster figures Remco had released back in 1980-81. And I had said, due to time constraints, I would elucidate about the 9 inch figures at a later time. Well, that time is now. The 9 inch line of Universal Monster figures were very well made and looked great with a window box front, glow in the dark heads and hands, cool clutching arm action, and the inclusion of a glow in the dark skull ring and monster iron on. But unfortunately, they were not very well received. In 1980, the initial 9 inch assortments were released with Dracula the Frankenstein's monster, and the mummy being fairly easy to find. But then there's that pesky wolfman. My sources claim that there was simply one wolfman to a case of 12 figures, making them harder to find. Upon their release, the 9-inch line was fighting an uphill battle, seeing that smaller-sized, sci-fi-themed action figures dominated toy store shelves at the time. Add to that, in 1981, Remco released the 3 and 3 quarter inch monster figures, along with a carrying case and the Monsterizer playset. These figures became highly popular as kids could play with them in conjunction with their Star Wars figures, Clash of the Titan, Battlestar Galactica, and every other smaller size figure that was popular at the time. To add insult to injury, Remco had already planned a release, a second wave of figures, the same four from the first assortment, and add in two more figures, the Phantom of the Opera and Creature from the Black Lagoon. As the first assortments languished on toy store shelves, and due to the cost of the 9-inch individual figures, very little if any toy stores reordered the second wave, making the Phantom and Creech two highly desirable figures today. On the collector's market, you can find Frank, Drac, and Mummy fairly easily and affordable. You'll pay a little more for old Fuzzface, and expect to shell out for that Phantom and that scaly pajama-wearing creature. <laughs> Got any sneak peeks of monster merchandise coming out soon? Drop Derek a line and he'll forward it along to me here at MKR. This is Mark, Dr. Tom Peterson saying, happy monster collecting everybody. I'm out. Peace. The three fantastic supermen. America's favorite superheroes, three times as agile, three times as strong, three times as clever. Go to it, Nick. Without the use of guns or modern weapons, they fight for truth, justice, and international peace. The three fantastic supermen, aided by Professor Schwartz and his marvelous bulletproof supersuits, as they face the forces of terrorism and corruption. Real mass production of gold, and I can double or triple it whenever I like. <laughs> Obviously, I'm already the richest man in the world, and you may be wondering why I'm continuing. The diabolical golem who buys and enslaves beautiful women. Just 
as I feared. Slightly radioactive. The banknotes were made by a universal reproducer. A what? A machine which can reproduce anything. The three fantastic supermen use their bare hands, their wits, and their humor to overcome the cohorts of the underworld. Coming soon to this theater. Three animated TV series, three animated feature films, over 50 years of stories, over 150 characters, 10 core comic book titles, 27 spin-off comic book titles, nearly 30 limited series spin-offs, and of course, four feature films. Well, okay, five if you count Captain America Civil War, or maybe it's like four and a half. The Avengers are a Marvel Comics mainstay, and no matter how many films crush it at the box office, or how many more Avengers spin-off titles come out, it all comes back to that original comic series that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby thrust upon the world in 1963. And I'm going to read the entire run. My name is Derek M. Cook, and I'm a recovering comic book fan. Over on my YouTube channel, Comic Stalgia, you can join me as I make my way through the comic with my Reading the Avengers YouTube series. Every episode, I'll take a look at an issue of the comic, share my thoughts about the story, its artwork and characters, and reflect on how the issue may have impacted or inspired other facets and corners of all things Marvel. I'd like to invite you to join me as I make my way through every single issue of this iconic comic book. Assemble with me at tinyurl.com slash reading the Avengers or look up Comic Stalgia on YouTube where you can find all the previous episodes and even subscribe to make sure you don't miss anything while we're reading the Avengers. That's tinyurl.com slash reading the Avengers. Nuff said. Hola, cabezones de radio de los niños monstruos. Soy Kenny con un vistazo a monstruos famosos de la tierra del cine. The last part of the Monsters from Mexico article appears in issue 125 from April of 1976, which featured the new King Kong on the cover. The article starts on page 44, is 7 pages long, and has 12 photos. Walt Lee starts this part with this description of the Guanajuato Mummy movies. The Guanajuato Mummy films are based on a well-known ghoulish tourist attraction of that Mexican state. At least one cemetery in Guanajuato has long required that continuing rent be paid for burial sites. If the rent on the cemetery plots is not kept up, the mummified corpses are exhumed and put on display. Needless to say, Guanajuato has a very dry climate. Admission is charged to visit the catacombs filled with the mummies. There have been several films made about the Guanajuato mummies coming to life, most of them in color. The first of the series was simply called The Guanajuato Mummies. In that film, the wrestling trio of Santo, Blue Demon, and Mil Mascaris battled the revivified mummies. He then briefly mentions two films from that series, The Castle of the Mummies of Guanajuato and The Theft of the Mummies of Guanajuato. The article continues with a report from Eric Hoffman, who describes the Spanish-Mexican co-production The Return of the Walpurgis Night, which stars Paul Nashi. FM editor Forrest G. Ackerman finishes the article with a look at the Mexican films Boris Karloff participated in at the end of his career. An article on Mexican movies may seem a strange place to find the late Boris Karloff, but his final four films were Mexican-American collaborations. His scenes in these four pictures were shot back-to-back, -back, in color, over a period of five weeks in 1968 in studio facilities called Hollywood Stage. Or he goes on to mention Fear Chamber, Snake People, House of Evil, and The Incredible Invasion. Forey was with Boris on the set of Fear Chamber, and he had this to say about Carlos' reaction to the script. When the scene was over, Boris Karloff explained to me, This Fear Chamber is far out science fiction. I have mountains of dialogue. My word, is there mountains to memorize. And I haven't the slightest idea what I'm saying. 
But who would wish for less dialogue in a Karloff film? Held in the thrall of that unique, unforgettable voice, who would ever tire of listening? FM photographer Walt Doherty was on the set of Karloff's last film, which was a Mexican production. He covered the fire at sequence in The Incredible Invasion, which was the final scene of the movie and the scene that rang down the curtain on Karloff's theatrical career, although he was still to be seen a time or two on TV shows made following the Mexican movies. Afterwards, Doherty relates, Karloff made an impromptu speech thanking all the actors in the crew. It was an emotion-charged occurrence, and more than one eye in the group was moist, my own included. The look at Monsters from Mexico ended with this typical, pun-filled look at things to come. And what does the future hold, Mexican monster movie-wise? South World, Son of West World, Senor Exorcist, Mexicali Rosemary's Baby, The Aztec Mummy Meets the Electric Charro, The Tortilla That Ate Acapulco. Well, one thing we can pretty well promise you. Whichever way the enchilada crumbles, five years from now, our Mexican expert, Walt Lee, will pick up the pieces, put them together, and give us his 1980 report on the last five years of new Mexican monster movies. Hasta la vista, amigos. Here he is. Watch out, for here is a superhuman with the strength of a hundred men. and nothing seems able to stop him. Invincible, invulnerable. Argo Man, the fantastic Superman. But even he had his Achilles heel, a beautiful woman's kiss. Kill each other. Kill each other. Ah! Argo Man, the fantastic Superman. Kill each other. A man gifted with such extraordinary powers that ordinary men were helpless to cope with him. Everyone and everything was pitted against him, from hired killers to the most diabolical inventions of modern science. The world's most beautiful women vied for his favors, or the chance to kill him. each other. Argo Man, the fantastic Superman. picture which will take you on a journey out of time, carry you on a crest of thrills and laughter from start to finish. Be sure to see this Superman power. Don't miss it. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. You need to take out the trash. 
I don't have time for that now. We have two podcasts I have to create a new promo for. What? Both JLU cast and Supermates? Yes. JLU cast where you and I discussed the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited animated series from Bruce Timm and company. And Supermates, our original show where we talk about all sorts of geeky stuff, including our annual House of Frankenstein series on classic horror films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. But how do we combine this into one promo? I have no idea, but it sounds like we're doing our original Supermates promo all over again. I kind of think we are, but hey, other folks kind of aped it, so it must have worked. Well, why don't you get to work taking out the trash, and I'll finish up. Great. So join us, Cindy. And Chris. On JLU Cast and Supermates, both proudly part of the Fire and Water Podcast Network, found at fireandwaterpodcast.com and on iTunes. This is Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned. And don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. I don't have this guy on very often, and I need to correct that because I always loved chatting with him. Has it been a year since you were on the show last? It's been about that. I think the last time that we, yeah, it was like August was the last time I was on because I was on for uh, Edgar August Poe. Oh, that's right. That's right. Listeners, if you don't recognize the voice, this is Jonathan Inbody, the man behind the X Meets Y podcast. Welcome back, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me back. All these theme months I just push my way into. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I reached out to you this time. That's yeah, true. I, I should have been pushing myself in sooner is the problem, probably. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the thing is, is that I've been adding so many people to the Monster Kid Radio ever rotating stable of guests that uh, it's hard to get everybody in, man. You oh, know, yeah. I go way too long between people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's let's make it a point to get you in for a non theme month. How about that? Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. Let's plan for that. Let's mm-hmm. plan for that. So X meets Y. How's the podcast going? It's going great. We just uh, celebrated our one year anniversary uh, a couple of months ago. Fantastic. And it's been it's like been a crazy year of essentially a crash course of me learning how to podcast. We've got some really great episodes that just recently came out like, well, it's, it's going to be a little dated by the time of this release, but um, we just did an episode with Jason Giaconetti from Bots, Bugs and Babes. That was the Predator meets Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is the other one. <laughs> I had it pulled up and everything and then I still forgot it when it came to say it. <laughs> I haven't listened to that one yet, but I did see the post on it. And Jason Giaconetti, and one of these guys that I need to have on the show again, uh, I think last time I had him on was last year's Lucha de Mayo. So I need to get him back into the mix here too. But yeah, Bots, Bugs, and Babes, fun podcast. He's a good guy. I've actually been on that a couple times uh, since we last chatted too. I did Neon Maniacs that, that you and I talked about, I think, the last time I was here. But then um, oh, just uh, <laughs> just last month. <laughs> Uh, just last month, I did 13 Ghosts on Bots, Bugs, and Babes as well. That's episode 57, in case you guys are listening back to this later. Nice. Yeah, Oh, it was a fun one. Two completely different kinds of movies. Awesome. <laughs> yes, very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to go down the Neon Maniacs rabbit hole <laughs> this time. Um, yeah, th- it's, it's too much. There, it's a gigantic rabbit hole. <laughs> it 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 is, and I've got all sorts of... yeah. It, moving on. X meets Y. <laughs> Tell people what it is if... I mean, I'm going to play the promo in this episode, but for people who don't know, uh, it, it's kind of an improv-style show. You've got two movies that are typically very different from each other. Yeah. Uh, and, and you spring it on the people that come on the show and say, hey, make a movie out of it, right? Pretty much. It is very intimidating in the sense that it is improv. And, like, I don't even have improv training. I've just, like, hovered in those improv worlds. So... <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, we... we select two movie titles from a list that I have loaded into a randomizer app. Then we just have half an hour to combine them into a totally new, totally original movie idea. And it's pretty crazy. Some episodes are like completely insane and bizarre and are exercises in hilarious futility as we try to make them work together. And some kind of naturally go together. 
Um, but that's kind of the fun of the show is that it's all very chaotic. Well, I do play the promo pretty regularly here on the show. So listeners, if you haven't checked it out yet, go give it a listen. Uh, do you have your own website for it or is it through Libsyn or Facebook? Or? Uh, yeah, you can just find it on um, xmeetsy.libsyn.com or um, you can uh, just like our Facebook page. Uh, which has a big long URL, but uh, you know, if you go to xmeetsy.libsyn.com, the Facebook uh, link should be all over the place. So <laughs> right on, and if it's on Libsyn, that means you can get it on the iTunes Store and pretty much any other podcast directory these days. So check it out when you're done listening to this episode. Here's some more of Jonathan and his ever rotating stable of guests. <laughs> yes, please. It is wacky as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before we started recording, though, you said you had a few more things coming up. And I know when we had you on last year, we talked a little bit about writing and that sort of thing. You've got some stuff coming up. I do. Yeah, I've been kind of pivoting into writing a bunch of short stories and then just kind of throwing them out into the world and seeing what people will publish. I've done a couple of drabbles, which are uh, for anybody that doesn't know, they're like 100 word short stories. And I have uh, two drabbles that are getting published in a drabble anthology. Uh, I'm just going to see how many times I can say the word drabble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the anthology is called Dark Drabbles Number One Worlds. It's from an uh, independent little press called Black Hair Press. And pre orders are open now. They're all sci fi based, uh, 100 word short stories. It's really great. It's got a lot of great uh, authors contributing to it. I'm very excited to be a part of it. Drabbles are something I wasn't sure that I would be good at when I started, and then I really, really enjoyed writing them, so now I've written like 10 of them. The next iteration of flash fiction basically is what uh, Drabbles can be probably best described as and black hair press. You can find it blackhairpress.com and that's hair as in the rabbit, not the yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So, um, and yeah. Then, uh, so yeah, check that out. Yeah. Yes. And then I also have a story called uh, dying feels like slowly sinking. That's like a full short story, not a drabble. Um, that's going to be released in an anthology called deteriorate from whimsically dark publishing. And they're also just uh, kind of an up and comer. Uh, I'm not sure when that one's going to release, but you know, I'll, I'll, uh, come back and let you guys know what it does. Right on. Well, we won't wait a year next time to have you back on to hear about it. Yes, How's that? please. That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this independent, the, the independent scene, when it comes to genre fiction, you can sometimes find some real winners in there. So congrats, man. Congrats. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I read a lot of weird stuff, so it, it works to kind of slip into these up and comers and then see see how weird I can get that they'll still publish. <laughs> right? Oh, well that's so cool, man. And yeah, you know, we were talking briefly about writing at the beginning of this and I wish you the absolute best uh with, with everything coming up uh with the anthology and any future endeavors you've got in the works writing wise. It can be kind of addictive once you start getting things published. Oh yeah. Like, oh I want more, I want more. Like <laughs> I mean and I'm right there, man. It's like, you know, my book's out and I'm like, man, I Got to get more going. Got to get more mm -hmm. out there. So I hear you. I hear you. Right on. Uh, anything else coming up for you? And, and before we move into the meat of what we're doing here? You know, I kind of got my finger in a lot of pies. Like I'm, I'm in the editing room on a short film. I remember that from last year. Yeah. Like I'm, we're like super close to locking it. And then we're going to send it around to some festivals. It's kind of an homage to uh, like 30s uh, universal horror stuff. I think I might have mentioned it to you off mic the last time that you and I chatted. We're in the editing room on that. It's super close to done. It's called Unearthed. It's like a mummy uh, little short. We'll, we'll see where that goes, but uh, I might be coming back to plug that as well later. <laughs> well, if you need any help with the sound design or sound effects, I happen to know a guy who's getting <laughs> into that, so I'm just saying. Yeah, I get you. Just, just saying. Very, very cool, man. Well, that's awesome. I love to hear when people who have been on the show, friends of the show, friends of the Monster Kid radio community, uh, are succeeding in their various Monster Kid pursuits. Because, I mean, really, we want to support each other, and we want to kind of have everybody's back and, and that sort of thing, especially, you know, us Monster Kids, you know, mm. of a younger generation or out there doing these more independent, non-traditionally uh, released or, or, or taking a non-traditional path to publication or distribution. You know, if there's anything that we can do to back each other up, I think that's really important to do just to get more Monster Kid content out into the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Like the community has got to stick together. Like I'm fairly young for this community, but a lot of people my age are not interested in any of this kind of stuff. And I think a lot of it is just because they haven't been exposed to it. I would really love to be able to expose this to as many people my age as possible. I'm talking like I'm 15 <laughs> as, as a like 
mid to late twenties guy. I'd like to expose this to as many people as possible my age and hopefully just keep increasing the size of this community. I mean, that's really what it's about. I mean, on some levels, I mean, we love this stuff and we're under no obligation, obviously to promote this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm older than you. I'm uh, generation X monster kid X is what I call myself. You know, even people in my generation is sometimes you know, disheartening to see that they don't really respect or even know of these films. And I know there are people in younger generations than my own, than myself, doing the same thing. Just, you know, that's awesome. People like you or Josh Kennedy, you know, I think is is probably in the same age range as you mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So that's just great. Uh, and, and good luck, man. I, I want to hear more about Unearthed uh, down the line. So oh, yes. keep me posted, man. Yeah, as soon as that is like out to a couple of festivals, as soon as we're figuring out if we're just going to toss it up on YouTube once it's done with the festival circuit or whatever, I'll come back and we'll talk all about it. And uh, I'm, I'm actually gearing up to shoot the next one relatively soon, too, because I'm going to do kind of a series of these. So it'll be fun. Right on, man. Yeah, we should talk more off, off mic. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have so much I want to say about it, but I don't want to announce. <laughs> I understand. I, I understand totally. I was real hesitant to talk about the book until I got my book out. Oh, I yeah. Just, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. But I don't want to jinx it or set any kind of odd expectations yes. that sort of thing. so i totally get it man totally get it so let's talk a little bit about monster kid radio stuff let's get into the monster kid radio frame of mind mm-hmm. by doing what we always do at the beginning of every conversation with somebody coming on the show and that's playing around of the classic five for listeners who don't know the classic five is a card game that we have here i've got a deck of cards they are a literal deck of cards and each one of these cards has a this or that what movie do you prefer style question on them all about classic monster or genre films it's really a conversation starter there are no points there's no way to lose the game there are no wrong answers but you know it's easier to call it a game than anything else anyways it's a classic five you ready to play well let's hope anyway we'll see we'll see if i am after <laughs> all right all right here we go card number one. Ooh, it's from the hammer deck which hammer film could use just one more sequel just one more uh i it, it breaks my heart to say it because i love mummies but the mummy series could really use one more because the first one is so good and then the rest are good but there's not quite enough of mummies in them and I just want one where it's a little more of a like traditional mummy style slasher, like the original mummy kind of has going on. I love that you call it a slasher because every time I bring these up and I talk about how they're like proto slashers, mm. that's, that's really what they oh, are. Yeah. I mean, you look at the slashers of the 80s and I don't know if it was an intentional thing to kind of take that style, but that's really what the mummy movies are. Somebody goes into an area, they do something they shouldn't have done, like in the 80s slasher movies, whether it's premarital sex or drugs or something. And they pay the price for it. Now, in the Mummy movies, there's not premarital sex or drugs, but, you know, they still violate some rule. Yeah. And they pay for it. It's almost a little deeper than that. The uh, wrongs that are being avenged tend to be, like, cultural wrongs. Like, it's about, like, British colonialization and all that, which is kind of crazy that they were pulling that stuff all the way back then. Sure. Sure. So, it's much deeper than a guy putting on a hockey mask. Yeah. You know? And killing campers. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit deeper than that. But, you know, at their core, that's it's kind of where they are, too. And, and I love Mummy movies. I love the Hammer Mummy movies mm-hmm. quite a bit. But so let's be honest, it is kind of diminishing returns the further you go in that franchise. Yeah, by the time you get to the last one, it feels like they don't want to make Mummy movies. And I don't understand why they keep making Mummy movies if they're not interested. Was that... Uh uh, uh, which one was that? The Valerie Leone? Yeah, I, the, all the titles for those ones are so... They're, they're, it gets so complicated with, like, Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, the Mummy's Shroud, like, whatever it is. Like, there's so many. Uh, yeah, it was Blood from the Mummy's Tomb. I think I think that was the last one in the run. Mm. I, I'd have to double check. Uh, and that one's got very, very little real mummy action yeah. uh, compared to all the others. And I, and I get it. It's 1971, and Hammer's focus is on the, uh, the ladies. Yes. Yeah, they definitely shifted. <laughs> You know, you you don't want to hide Valerie Leone's assets and bandages. (laughs) Just saying. I mean, not that I, you know, I'm going to go somewhere (laughs) on the show. All right. Anyway. (laughs) What is happening? Get back on track here, Derek. Card number two. You ready? Yes. (laughs) All right, here we go. Card number two. Who do you prefer? Bride of Frankenstein's Dr. Septimus Pretorius or House of Frankenstein's Gustav Niemann? I got to go with Pretorius, if only because Mm -hmm. of the like manic glee that he brings to a lot of it. I would love to watch a whole movie series just about him that's not even necessarily connected to the Frankenstein story. Like he should have gotten a spinoff. He just has like villain energy. It's just really fun to watch. Niemann is Karloff. Mm Mm-hmm. And Karloff's fantastic. It's awesome to see him come back to the Frankenstein franchise. But you are so right, man. 
Pretorius is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And say what you want about the dark universe and all that. I, I had high hopes when they put out the sizzle reel that was scored by Danny Elfman with all the clips of yeah. the previous Universal Monster movies. And that ends with Pretorius in the clip saying, you know, it's a new world of gods and monsters. I was hopeful that that meant that we were going to see a new iteration of Pretorius. Yeah. Now, obviously, that didn't happen in The Mummy with Tom Cruise and the Dark Universe thing kind of fizzled again. Yeah, the one the one I think would have been really great is the Bride of Frankenstein remake that they were going to do with the guy who directed the movie about the making of yeah, Bride God's of Frankenstein. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that seems like such a natural fit, and it really bums me out that that got canceled because of the Tom Cruise mummy like underperforming. Oh, Tom. Like, they could have oh, just Tom. done a second try. But or third try, since well, the movie was kind of the yeah. second. So. Yeah, because Universal keeps doing a first try and then pulling out. Yeah. Like, they've done that, like, five times. There's the Benicio Del Toro Wolfman. There's Dracula Untold. Like, it goes yeah. back a long time. Van Helsing. They just keep doing it. Somebody needs to put some uh, younger monster kids in charge, you know. Like, that like me? is Because, uh, I mean, well, I would take it. <laughs> like you? I was talking about like me, man. Come on. Oh, let's do it together. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all right. Here we go. Here we go. And I know Steve Sullivan would be like, oh, I want to write the script. So, oh, yeah. Please. We'll, we'll, yes. Let's just put, let, let's just do it. Let's start the Kickstarter so we can put the funds together to buy the rights. Oh, yeah. That'd and we'll great. just take it over. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be the most successful Kickstarter in history. I, well, or. <laughs> <laughs> or not. All yeah, right. Either way is fun. <laughs> See, this is what I love about this classic five. It's like a conversation starter, man. I'm all over the place and I love it. Mm -hmm. All right. Card number three. What two 1950s monster movies would make a great double feature? Uh, let's see. 50s. Hmm. I mean, I got to go with alligator people because I adore it. We've talked about that. <laughs> yeah. We've talked about that before. Every time I'm on this show, it comes up because I love it. Yes. I love it. Inside this strange, forbidding plantation, on the edge of the death-laden bios, there is a horror beyond belief. A scientist turns his cobalt rays on the revolting, scaly monarchs of the swamps to transform men into hideous, living gargoyles, whose faces must be forever hidden from human sight. He didn't have to hit him. Quick and simplest way, Doctor. But these are people. You don't handle them like animals. Beverly Garland as the unwelcome visitor, haunted by the fear that the man she loves has become one of them. What are you doing? I'm not leaving here, Mrs. Hawthorne, until I get the answers to the questions that brought me here. What have you done with my husband? Lon Chaney as the hook-armed, hate-maddened Cajun. I'll kill you, alligator man! Just like I'd kill any four-legged gator! Suspense that will clutch you like quicksand. Ah! <laughs> pulling you down into bottomless depths of suffocating horror. Ah! No! 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 <sighs> what would go well with alligator people? Hmm. I have no idea. You brought it up. <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble. Maybe mole people, because that'd be kind of fun. Bumping the two of those against each other. Huh. We're in 3000 BC. To reach this lost civilization, science had followed a trail through burning desert sands, through the roaring avalanches of Mount Kuitara, and finally deep into the bowels of the earth. Not even history had recorded the existence of this unknown empire of darkness. There is no world beyond ours. If I ever get out of here, into my world, the world of light and flowers. Will you come with me? Never before had outsiders beheld such sights. The sacred ritual of the sun death. The blazing sacrificial chambers. The court of the all-powerful high priests of Ishtar. You will die in the fire of Ishtar. The blood-lusting mole people storming from their subterranean caverns. Okay, I like it. I'm on board. <laughs> Those right. are the two I thought of, so that's what I'm sticking with. <laughs> there, hey, there you go. There you go. All right, card number four. Ooh, who else could have or should have played a mad scientist? Ooh, a mad scientist. I mean, there's uh, there's so many actors that could do great mad science. 
But since the last couple times I've been on here, I've gotten these types of questions, and I've always suggested spaghetti western actors to be horror people. I'm gonna say Lee Van Cleef. Ooh, I think he would be good at the like sniveling kind of uh, mad scientist. He can do the Weasley thing. Oh, because he's in that one Corman film, right? Oh, that's right, he is. And and you just kind of push him a little further into ooh, yeah, add a little bit of megalomania. Yeah. And he's like right there, right in the good wheelhouse for it. I dig it. Yeah. And you can bring up Spaghetti Westerns all you want because, you know, I love oh, them. I, yeah. I adore them. All right. Final card. And this one's timely for me because I just saw House on Haunted Hill last night. What's your favorite William Castle film? Ooh, I, I have to go with 13 Ghosts. Listen to William Castle, whom the Saturday Evening Post calls the master of movie horror. Do you believe in ghosts? I do. And you will, too, when you come to this theater and see my picture, 13 Ghosts. Uh, No more dictation today. When you see 13 Ghosts, you'll be given a supernatural viewer like this, which will enable you to penetrate for the first time into the spirit world. It will let you see all 13 of our weird, wonderful, and wildly assorted ghosts. Now, brace yourself as we take you across the threshold of our haunted mansion where there's a ghost for everyone in the family. Father, mother, sister, brother. You'll be scared stiff too when you see what they see. Thirteen ghosts materializing in ectoplasmic color through the magic of Illusiono, the ghost viewer. The ghost of a lion in the basement. The ghost of a murderous cook in the kitchen. Stop it! Stop it, I say! The ghost who speaks through the lips of the living. Death tonight to one of you. Ah! The evil ghost in the bedroom fighting to take possession of this beautiful girl. You'll feel all the thrills and chills of seeing one ghost multiplied by the magic number 13. I love The Tingler. I love House on Haunted Hill. I love at least half of his entire filmography. I would put in my top 50 movies ever, but I got to go with 13 Ghosts. The designs, the way that it's shot, the illusiono, like it's just such a perfect movie. I really love it. And it's the one that I just talked about with Jason Giaconetti on uh, Bots, Bugs, and Babes. Yeah, there you go. Fresh in your mind. Mm-hmm. Very cool, man. Yeah, I, I love 13 Ghosts. It's a lot of fun. Oh, a yes. lot of fun. All right, so that was the Classic Five. Jonathan, how do you feel? I feel good. It, it was uh, not as much of a disaster as I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I know. Said there's no winners and losers, but uh, you do win. And your prize is that you get to be on Monster Kid Radio this week. Best prize. 10 there out you of go. 10. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this episode is going out in the month of May, and May is Lucha de Mayo. I did it again. <laughs> Lucha de Mayo. Man. <laughs> and now every time I say, like, Cinco de Mayo, I say Cinco de Mayo, because I've listened to enough of these. I And I don't know why I get it wrong. I always say Cinco de Mayo. I, <laughs> I get that. I never have a problem with that. But for whatever reason, Lucha de Mayo. <laughs> this month messes with me, but the movie we're talking about this week did not. <laughs> yes, this is a, a a good one. Oh boy! So when I reached out to you, I was like, you know, I got to have you back on. You brought me Santo versus the Blob last time. What do you want to do this time around? I trust you. Give me something good. And you picked 1970s Santo versus the Blue Demon in Atlantis. Yeah, and I'm very surprised somebody else didn't pick it because this one is a real classic in my mind. Well, it's not very monster e per se yeah it's a little monster light but it's got a mad scientist i think it counts well you know and we did like i've done champions of justice during lucha de mayo so, mm-hmm. yeah i did it right when i don't think about it uh, <laughs> yeah, I, go. i've done champions of justice and that sort of thing which doesn't have the the typical traditional monster per se yeah. but you know these movies they're they're always of that kind of fantastical genre uh, mm-hmm. or at least when they are, they have a home here. And it's my podcast, so I can say anyway. Uh, so <laughs> this does have a mad scientist who is doing some pretty mad scientist-like things. So I think it counts. And it's an interesting film, an important film, too. You pointed something out to me when you mentioned this movie. And, and it's very important, I think, because, well, do you want to tell him you want me to? Uh, you go ahead. 
It's the first team up. Yes. It's the first time Santo and Blue Demon actually teamed up in a movie together. It's not the first time they appeared in a movie together. There was a Blue Demon film with Santo in like a cameo kind of position, but they didn't really interact. This is the first time they actually teamed up. It almost feels like Captain America, the Winter Soldier, because Blue Demon spends a lot of time like hypnotized and fighting him. (laughs) It's a weird dynamic that they have in this first one where you can tell both of them were like looking at the script and being like, well... Look, we, we neither of us can really win in this. Like, I, I want to win and he wants to win, but we got to keep this so it's mostly a tie. <laughs> I am so putting Captain America Winter Soldier in the show notes of this episode so that I can get those <laughs> extra clicks from oh, the yeah. search engine optimization bots out there. Oh, Captain, Avenger, uh, Captain Avengers? Captain Avengers. Captain America? Captain Avengers. I need more. Co- I'm just so pumped <laughs> talking about this movie. I'm <laughs> wired, man. I'm so, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, this one, when I suggested this one, I was like, I remember this one being good. Haven't watched it in a while. And I was like, oh, man, I really hope it's going to live up to Santo versus the Blob from last year. And then as soon as it starts and it has the crazy like war never changes monologue. Oh, this is this is incredible. I'm so glad I picked this one. (laughs) The opening bit. I mean, it's a lot of stock footage or footage pulled from uh, Japanese films, in fact. Oh, yeah. All over this movie. That and uh, Sword and Sandal Italian movies. They rip so much from (laughs) So much that they really had no right using. I'm sure that there wasn't a lot of permission granted here. No, I'm sure this was all stolen footage. (laughs) Yeah. Which, you know, it's in the 70s. Things are a little different. It's not like Mm. Toho's got a Google alert set up for (laughs) (laughs) who's using our Monster Zero footage. And so I so I, I get it. But because of that, because of this footage is in here, it makes this movie feel a lot bigger than... I'm going to say any Santo movie that I've seen, uh, it feels like it's got a huge budget, even though I know. Yeah, it was made for two nickels. (laughs) Yeah, and and they didn't shoot the expensive looking stuff. They lifted that. But because it's in there, it does seem to give it this this kind of higher perceived production value, which elevates it. it, It's kind of structured like a Bond movie, too, where they go like to a different a bunch of different places. Like it feels very expansive and like it's a like world hopping movie, even though it's really not. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I loved about this, too. In fact, I was just talking with somebody last night at the House on Haunted Hill screening about how much I love the spy movies from the 70s. Uh, uh, And the reason Mm. that came up was that the Joy Cinema, they typically show a bunch of trailers before the film. And for whatever reason, I don't know why Jeff Punk Rock Martin decided to match the spy trailer collection (laughs) with House on Haunted Hill, but that's (laughs) what he showed. And man, it just got me going. So that's playing. And then I watched Santo vs. Blue Demon in Atlantis last night when I got home from the joy. So I was in spy (laughs) mode. I love Euro spy films anyway. Huge fan of those. Uh, We were talking about Spaghetti Westerns earlier. I also love the Euro spy stuff. So to have that kind of spy world hopping thing going on here, who's double crossing who? Oh, there's an attractive woman. Is she really into Santo or is she there to get him? You know, it's really it really kind of hits on all those notes you mentioned captain america it's got a lot of the comic book notes as well and it makes this movie just fun yes absolutely just a lot of fun despite the fact that it opens with war is terrible and humans are bad (laughs) yeah it's humanity's failing is that fatal instinct that leads man to be man's killer that germ ensconced in his soul called violence like what this is a wrestling movie right (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and that sounds like the opening of Heart of Darkness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it's crazy. I love it, though. I mean, I love this setup. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. None of my love for it is, it, like, it, there's there's a light irony sprinkled over my love of this movie, but I truly, genuinely love every last thing that is in here. It might not go together perfectly. There might be a lot of seams visible, but this is a, an amazing movie. It is pound for pound as good as any James Bond film around that time as well. Like it's just so much fun. Those are bold words, man. (laughs) Look, I love James Bond, but I also love Santo. Yeah. I think I'd probably go down on the Santo side too. Don't tell Scott Morris. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) He is a huge (laughs) Bond fan and a running joke between him and I and our mutual wives is that someday Scott and I are going to add yet another podcast to our list by doing a James Bond podcast. Uh, <laughs> oh, that'd be amazing. If you do, I, I want to be a guest on at least one of the Roger Moore ones. Cause Roger Moore is like prime bond yeah, for me. I love same him. here. He was, he was my first bond. So yeah, but yeah, we always kind of joke we're going to start the cast bond cast. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know if that's really going to happen because our wives might kill us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's always the risk you run, yeah, though. <laughs> you know, hey, I'm not working right now. What else am I going to do? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So to describe this film, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I typically don't like to just go to the Internet Movie Database and read something off the website. But the summary here posted by somebody named Javier, I think fits this movie perfectly. And I'm going to read it here and share it with you guys and gals now. A Nazi scientist using the lost city of Atlantis as his home base threatens to destroy civilization with a nuclear bomb. The Nazi scientist wants the Third Reich to rule again, and if his demands are not met, he will follow through on his threat of nuclear annihilation. With very little time to spare, Santo is enlisted to find the nuclear bomb, disarm it, and end the Nazi scientist's diabolical plan. It's pretty accurate. How do you not want to see this movie just from that? Like, that description should sell anyone immediately. Exactly. And it's Santo versus the Blue Demon. So you've got this immediate feud built up and in in real life they were not buds Mm -hmm. they were rivals and i don't know where they were in their respective careers at that point i know they did face each other a few times over the years and blue demon i think had more wins over santo by the time they were both done wrestling so i don't know if a santo versus blue demon thing was a thing at that point but if it was that just kind of pushes this movie a little bit forward too into the audience The initial fight that is in the ring between Santo and the Blue Demon, they're really going at it. Like, that's a good uh, match of Lucha. Like, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, by the time people hear this, they will have heard uh, the coverage that I did with Mark Peterson. Oh, well, and and I guess Jeff Pellier as well when we did uh, the Santo, Blue Demon, Dracula, Wolfman movie. And the wrestling matches in that are staged for the film. It's very obvious they're on a stage somewhere. The back, it's just... It's not the best. I mean, the wrestling's fine, but, you know, whatever. The matches in this, yeah, they're shot in a more unique way than I'm used to seeing in a lot of these movies uh, with the camera angles and such, which typically Mm -hmm. a lot of the wrestling matches in these movies are actually real luchador matches, (laughs) lucha matches that they just kind of repurpose. Yes. This one, I feel like they shot a little bit more creatively, specifically for the film even, perhaps. And Mm -hmm. they're pretty exciting that first match starts with blue demon being like, I'm going to tear him apart. And then it's like a real fight for a while at the beginning where it's like, there's some real energy between the two of them. Yeah. They, they definitely had sparks, man. They might not have gotten along. They might've been real life rivals, but they really knew how to work that chemistry and work the crowd. Even the entrance, they're being hoisted into the ring, brought to the ring by their managers or their team or whatever, sitting on the shoulders of people. So they're above everybody else coming in. There's a lot of fanfare there. It's, just really cool. And we use this wrestling match to get into the story. It's not just mm-hmm. filler. A lot of times in these movies, the wrestling match is there to, hey, now it's time to wrestle. There's actually yeah. a story element here in that somebody's trying to drug them. <laughs> and we're going to yes. see them swap the water out that they're going to use with, with, well, something drugged that's going to knock them out. Now, Santo <laughs> refuses. With identical water that somehow has drugs in Yeah, it. sure. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, whatever. Well, you know, it's an evil Nazi scientist who's been around forever, so he's figured it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Santo refuses the water. Yes, he doesn't need to drink, I guess. And Blue Demon does take the water, and he succumbs to mm-hmm. uh, being knocked out, basically, so that they can get him from the wrestling ring to the Nazi scientist, whose name is Achilles. <laughs> okay. He is the most, like, Bond villain uh, bad guy that Santo, I think, ever fought. I think so he too. Is, he like has the underwater base. He has the henchmen that are all themed. He's perfect. Yeah, I, I I love Achilles in this movie. He is a delight to watch. Uh, Achilles is played by a guy by the name of Ivan J. Arado, who did some work in uh, up through the nineties. Really, he was in one of the subspecies movies over at Full Moon. Uh, he was hmm. in the movie Mac and Me, which is terrible, but Paul Rudd loves playing it on Conan O'Brien. Uh, yeah, he's a character in that. Uh, he's in That's an episode crazy. of Fantasy Island. I mean, he's mm. all over. Mm. You know, he did quite a bit. He also did a few other of the Luchador movies. Um, Santo and Animo, uh, and Animo Mortal. I'm not sure, but he's in that as well. You know, he did some others. And he was also in Santo and Blue Demon Against the Monsters, which is just awesome. Came out the same year. So that one is 
absolutely yeah. wonderful. Uh, but he's a great villain. He really is. And you're right. Mm-hmm. He's a great Bond villain, a great 70s Bond villain, where there's a little bit of camp, but he's still, you know. Yes. Mm. He's kind of like a Bond villain meets uh, like Maximilian Zeus, the bad guy from Batman who thinks he's the like a thunder god or something. Like he thinks he's Zeus, I think. <laughs> He's like that guy. This guy, Achilles, seems to think he is Achilles, right. <laughs> which is odd. So he's a Nazi scientist. He figured out like regenerative stuff so he doesn't really age. I don't know how he goes from that to thinking he's like a reincarnated g- Greek guy. <laughs> like, I, I have no idea. But, you know, I was I was <laughs> on board. So whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. None of it is. None of it takes you out of it. You're just like, yeah, seems right. Guy's crazy. Ex Nazi, sure. Why not? What is the what's the name <laughs> of the organization that they work for? The Global Something Force. Yeah, it's like Global Security Agency or something. There we go. There we go. And Santo is an agent in in the agent. He, uh, his uh, call sign is what X twenty one. Yes. And there's at least twenty five of them because later we do meet an X twenty five as well. I want to know more about this Global Security Agency. I, I want to know more about that group. I want more stories with them. Yeah, I would love for there to be movies that are just about them, where at some point there's like a cameo from Santo, where somebody's like, oh, we need Santo's help. Uh, don't tell everybody it's Santo. Just say, hey, we need to get X-21 in here. Yes. Just somebody else with a silver mask. Yeah. And then, boom, he's in. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that. Uh, I don't think Blue Demon is really part of the agency, though, is he? No, he's kind of his own thing. He, he's he got a little bit of a, um, like, Raphael from Ninja Turtles mean streak. So it, <laughs> it feels like he's working on his own. <laughs> That's a really good way to put it. I mean, I typically compare them Santo, Superman, Blue Demon, Batman. But yeah, that's a really good way to put it, too. It's a bit like Leonardo and Raphael is is how I always think of the two of them. Because Santo is just such like traditional hero, leader, man, mm-hmm. beloved by the people. And then <laughs> Blue Demon's scrappier. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, which I don't think Blue Demon was really happy about. The things that I've read... The rivalry existed because Santo was always treated as better than Blue Demon. And Mm. even in these movies, how many times does Blue Demon get hypnotized, uh, get turned into an evil clone? Constantly, Uh, yeah. Yeah, constantly. It's like Blue Demon is the the weak link to get into the luchador circle or whatever, according to the bad guys. And and I get that. It does get a little old and tiresome after a while. But I can't go back to 1970 and make a new Blue Demon movie where he's the hero and Santo's the villain. So That would be pretty cool, though. <laughs> oh, it would be awesome. That would be awesome. So let's start the Kickstarter campaign to build the time machine. Yes, absolutely. To go back and- <laughs> we'll add it to our other Kickstarter to buy the rights to the Universal Monsters. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> what are we talking about? Anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, it's basically we're going to stop the mad scientist. He wants to blow up the world. He's going to do all these terrible, terrible things. Yeah, he's got a rocket base on the moon that he's shooting missiles down from and blowing up islands. Because that's what you do when you're trying to make a point. Of course. (laughs) How else do you talk to the world leaders if not by blowing up a Pacific island? (laughs) Well, it's going to be okay because we've got somebody on our side who can intercept these bombs. Yes, Professor Gerard. Or Agent X. 22. Mm-hmm. Now, it's this guy that when they meet, doesn't Santo make him take off his shirt? Yeah, Santo uh, holds him at gunpoint and is like, hey, global security, what's something about this guy that enemies wouldn't know to replicate, whatever? And they're like, oh, he has a weak heart. And as soon as they said that, because Santo like checks for uh, the artificial heart where it was implanted, whatever. And I was like, it's a good thing you're not like sitting there holding him at gunpoint or anything, because otherwise he might have a heart attack and die. <laughs> well, I love that he just reaches over and just starts tearing the shirt open. Just there's yeah. no. It's just one solid movement. Like the guy's yep. shirt was was buttoned with like snaps instead of buttons. <laughs> Well, it is X-22, and, and he's part of the story as well. And there's a lot of, we got to get the professor, and we're going to send Blue Demon back out there after we've hypnotized him, <laughs> after we've tried to beat him up. Uh, they do have a pretty cool brawl, yes, actually, with Blue Demon, which sometimes, and I think I've talked about this too, in these movies, the wrestling outside of the ring sometimes suffers, because it's not in a ring. You don't have ropes to bounce off of. You don't have the same environment. But I feel like the fight scenes here... Outside of the ring, especially with Blue Demon. 
really good. It's in the set where you have uh, Achilles on his throne and all his henchmen standing around. So you know they're going to have to be careful about spacing and about how far they go on this set while they're fighting. But the space they have, they use really well. They like go all over the place. There's a lot of flipping and almost pinning and all that kind of stuff. It works really well. I was very, very pleased with it. Uh, later in the film, Sando gets in on some of that action as well, some non-wrestling ring wrestling, which, you know, he was good at as well, but it, it still felt not nearly as authentic for me, yeah. but then I'm a big Blue Demon fan, so of course I'm going to skew that way. Mm. Do you have a preference between the two? I'm a Santo guy. I, I like okay. Santo. There's something about heroes like Superman that, that I really like about them just kind of being a moral paragon where it's like everybody just kind of looks up to them and they have a lot weighing on their shoulders, and I find it really interesting uh, what can be done with that. Fast and NC, and oh, I can hear Dominique Lambs. He's getting ready to smack me from wherever she's at. <laughs> I've always felt that Batman's a little overrated. I've never been a huge Batman fan. Yeah. Yet Blue Demon is the Batman of the Luchadors, and he's my favorite between the two. I, I think Blue Demon is almost more of a uh, Red Hood. Like he's he's a little more disconnected. Like he doesn't have the okay. butler, the all the stuff. He's just kind of a vigilante on his own, who's like rage motivated. <laughs> Okay, okay, so he's like, he starts at Batman and starts going toward the Punisher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a terrifying thought, too. Which there's a lot of a lot of luchadors wielding guns in this movie, too. <laughs> like, there really both of them are. have pistols at a couple different points. They really, I mean, nobody's got a flamethrower like in Santo versus the Blob, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> there, is, there is a mid-air joust between two helicopters with pistols. I love that so much. It might be the greatest action scene ever put to film. <laughs> I'd watch a feature film of nothing but that. That it's was incredible. just so fun. <laughs> what happened in this movie? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but th again, it's... It, kind of speaks to that that spy aesthetic you know the crazy wacky roger moore james bond moments yeah they have their set pieces that they want to get to in this kind of filtered through the eyes of a luchador mask you know just yeah. all over the place and i absolutely love it so they they hypnotize blue demon they send him back out into the field to get santo and he's kind of successful at it at the very beginning but Blue Demon is acting a little strange and Santo catches on pretty quick. It's not as though the uh, Achilles has an, a better option than sending Blue Demon because he sends a guy to kill Santo before and Santo just throws the guy through every piece of furniture in Santo's apartment and then tosses him <laughs> out a window. <laughs> so like, it's not like anybody but Blue Demon could even slightly hold their own against Santo, but Blue Demon's also not that clever like, you can't really trick Santo. Santo pretty immediately is like, hey, what's up with you? Are you mind controlled? <laughs> uh, 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 no, no. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> well, you know, he starts out OK. It's like, well, don't take your car, Santo. Take mine. Let me drive. They're going to know your car. You know, when it, and, and I get that. Mm. That works. That's clever. Yeah. But yeah, the rest of the car rides not. So no, because basically Santo's like, hey, pull over. And <laughs> Blue Demon's like, no. And then they just start fighting. While they're driving. While driving, yeah. It's it's yeah. not great. I mean, it's a good stunt, but... Uh, and it's not just that they shove each other. I mean... They... Oh, yeah, they're full-on, like, punching each other while driving a moving car. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love that. Now, when they do get out of the car, they do start going at it, and uh, they're joined by a few more henchmen from the professor, and then they're saved... <laughs> yes. ...because somebody else shows up with a gun. X-25. ...who starts shooting at them and... <laughs> So there's four people versus Santo, uh, this blue demon and three other henchmen. Mm. Two of them go down. She shoots two of them. And then the other two just stop and look at each other. Somebody's shooting at us. We got to go. And they run. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Commitment to your cause, pal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're just work a day henchmen. You know, they probably don't have any stock in, in Achilles's business, you know. <laughs> Not like they have health insurance or anything. If something <laughs> yeah. happens, you know, it's like, oh, well, we're out of here. Yeah, they don't <laughs> want to go to a free clinic with bullet wounds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, too many questions they have to answer. You it's know, just the authorities are calling. Yeah. yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just a hassle. <laughs> <laughs> this movie, I, <laughs> I love all these films. The ones that I am usually drawn to the most are the ones that just make me laugh with glee. Oh, yeah. We're laughing a lot at this movie, but okay, let me strike that. We're not laughing 
at the movie per se. We're laughing because we're having a good time. Certainly. Yeah. There are issues with the film. Uh, there, there are some budgetary constraints. Yes, he did pull some stock footage from things he probably shouldn't have. Yeah. Some of the store beats don't make a lot of sense and character motivations, huh? But <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun ride. I had so much fun watching this. By the time it was over, I was like, man, that, that's it? I felt like it just zipped by. Yeah, it goes really fast. Every new action scene is something that you really haven't seen before. The aforementioned gun jousting (laughs) with the helicopters. They keep raising the stakes and giving us something new. It starts with a wrestling match at the beginning and ends with a pistol joust between two helicopters in the air. (laughs) And we hit every conceivable step in between to get to that point. (laughs) Yeah, there's a fist fight in a moving car. Like, there's just so much in this where you're just like, oh, I can't wait to see how this shakes out. It's so fun to watch. It's a blast. And... What, what I love is that Santo is is the super spy. He does everything that James Bond would do. He's got the little contraption in his ear that works as his radio, which I thought that was kind of neat. You don't have a lot of gadgets per se, but you yeah. do have that. He even gets the ladies. Yes, he, even he does. Gets the ladies. And, and I know Santo was big about, you know, I make these movies for families and kids can come see them and all that. But he gets a little action one night. And the way they shoot that sequence was very well done, I thought. It was nice and subtle. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're on the couch together laying down and the lights go down and then somebody reaches over and turns the light back on. And, well, you know, uh, they've had some fun <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we're moving on with the story. So it's not explicit per se, but I thought it was actually handled with a bit of subtlety. Yeah, it's not bad. The the like move over to the light, turn it off, turn it back on is a pretty good device. This kind of movie usually doesn't have that that kind of cinematography where they think it out that much. And that's a really nice touch to get from one scene to the next. I'm wondering if they stole that from somewhere, if somebody just thought of that. Because I'm thinking of like uh, noir movies a lot will like pan over to the window and then they'll pan back, you know? Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering if it's there's some specific movie that already has the pan over to the light switch, turn off, turn back on. Or if that's something that they created because it's a really good device. It really does work. I mean, it shows the passage of time as well as the passage of love. You know, I mean, it's great. I don't know much about the director on here, but I do know the director's name doesn't appear attached to a lot of the other movies I talk about during Lucha de Mayo. Julian Solar or Solar. I, I don't know yeah. anything about him. I don't know how many other Luchador films he did, but he had one heck of a career, over 80 credits oh, wow, as a director. Yeah. I'm looking at it now and they're I think they're all Spanish language. So, yeah. It'd be probably mm-hmm. hard to find almost anything else that we'd be able to have access to of his career to even see if if he's like that level of filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, he really did kind of bring something to the table that you don't see with a lot of these other films. Uh, there, there is a nice eye to this. I mean, we were talking about that and the cinematography during the wrestling matches, mm-hmm. the way that was shot. Yeah, Very definitely. well done. Really impressed by this film. And even the music choices are a little different than what you normally get with these types of movies. I, I like to just, and I've said it a couple of times this month already, I like to describe the music in most of these movies as like drunken ice cream truck music, <laughs> um, which, you know, yes, it's, it's not the best, but 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 it's, it, it's got a certain flavor. The music in this film doesn't have that. It, it feels more, hey, we're going to get into a spy mode, you know? Yeah, it's like, it's like a sad jazz most of the time. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good way to put it really good way to put it like it's a little bit bluesy Mm -hmm. what are some of the other uh, standout moments for you in the film i mean for me the the entire last act is so incredible because they have the cave set that they've used in a couple of other santo movies santo and the blue demon fighting a bunch of henchmen there's the guns going around there's achilles trying to escape there's all kinds of double crosses the whole last half hour of this movie is exactly what i want out of a like euro spy uh luchador movie it just really works perfectly. Like they knew exactly what they were doing when they started this movie. I almost wonder if the fact that it doesn't have any traditional monsters in it kind of freed this movie to just go all out and all over the place. It's a kind of movie where I feel like if it was being made a little more for just the sake that it of, of selling it, it would have like, Oh, there's a sea monster now, you know, like it would have something like that that would kind of distract but it really doesn't it just moves ahead at a a decent clip and just kind of gets you from point a to point b and it's a very effective little spy thriller yeah you mentioned uh the sea monster possibility there are no sea monsters in it but there are some underwater shots and i just love the image of luchadors wearing scuba gear (laughs) going underwater they're still wearing their masks i just love that 
Yeah, I think my favorite is um, when they first bring Blue Demon back to the Atlantis base. He's like mind controlled, so he's just standing still. And they're just like putting the scuba gear on him. <laughs> Luchador masks are just cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Every every movie would be improved by a luchador being in it. I agree. Oh, 100%. Casablanca. <laughs> I mean, we're recording this the morning after I released the first episode of Lucha de Mayo. And I don't know if you've heard it yet or if listeners have heard this, but one thing that Jeff Pelier and I were talking about, were, somehow or other, we brought up Lord of the Rings and how awesome that would have been if that was made with luchadors. That'd be incredible. Oh, you could call it Fellowship of the Ring, but like the wrestling ring. Right? There you go. Now it's a movie. Now it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> There's an X meets Y for you there. You yeah. Know. Oh, definitely. Santo versus Blue Demon in Atlanta meets <laughs> Fellowship of the Ring. Go. <laughs> <laughs> We're going straight to Kickstarter. <laughs> That's right. Hey, there we go. There's our third one. We'll put it all together. <laughs> oh, there we go. Time travel, Luchador Tolkien, <laughs> Universal Monsters. <laughs> Uh, Luchador movies did kind of tap into a lot of different things. They had some time travel episodes. They fought monsters. They fought spies. I don't know if they ever went flat out fantasy. So there we go. We need to do that. That needs to be a thing. That would be pretty great. Like, I would love just Santo in, like, the movie Kroll. Oh, my God. Like, Santo <laughs> with the glaive. Like, that'd be great. That's like a masterpiece in waiting, you know? Mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we missed our calling, man. Here we are podcasting and writing short stories. We should be making movies like this, man. We really should. Yep. Yep. If anyone wants to give us money to make uh, Santo in Kroll, <laughs> that's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, the rights for Kroll, I'm sure they're like $10. Yeah, I, like. I, can't, I can't imagine those are very expensive. <laughs> yeah, probably not. They're just sitting in a vault somewhere. You know, and if we agreed to cast Santo's son, I'm sure we can get the rights to Santo. So That would be awesome. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> We'll talk off mic. We'll talk off mic. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to cut all this because, you know, we don't want people knowing our, our future. No, projects. this is solid gold, man. We don't want anybody to steal this wonderful idea. Um, <laughs> well, I agree with you about the ending of the film. I think the last act, once we start escalating and, and just getting wackier and more and more out there, a little bit more stock footage and a little bit more out there. And then they got the guns and the helicopters. I think that's really just a lot of fun. But for me, I think one of my favorite bits is when Santo is in the with the ladies <laughs> uh, and <laughs> and uh, she is with him and they start to kiss and you know in the reflection behind everybody he can see somebody sneaking up behind him and I just like that moment as well it's just a nice little spy moment one of the more quiet spy moments that you see in a lot of the James Bond movies where yeah it's nice yeah it was a nice little moment and the twist on that the turnaround on that was well I'm not here to get you Santo I'm I'm here to get the girl who was going to get you, you know, and yeah, that's what's really happening here. I thought it was kind of cool too. And they get a little bit of a fight scene at the end of that scene. I still don't know who is a bad guy. Well, that's true. I, I'm not sure who was who and who was working for what. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the guy who comes in to hit him seems to be a bad guy. Cause he tries to like shoot Santo. And this is the scene where Santo is throwing the guy through all of his furniture. Yeah. <laughs> they completely destroy Santo's apartment. It's like a 10 minute <laughs> fist fight. Like it's basically the fist fight from they live, but with more props. <laughs> And then, no, no, I'm a good guy, Santo. And then as soon as Santo, like, turns around to look at the girl, the guy, like, tries to hit him again. But the girl, I think, gets shot. I know. That scene is, for a scene that seems like it's very straightforward, that scene is very confusing. The lead up is pretty straightforward. And then it's yes. like, oh, wait a minute. I remember what kind of movie we're making here. And then they just yeah. kind of go off the rails again. And Santo just throws the guy out the window and we're done. <laughs> we're moving on. <laughs> Oh, man, what a treat, man. What a treat. Now, you were reading uh, or you, you read out like the beginning of the movie at the beginning of this conversation about the film, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the talk about violence and man becomes a man killer or whatever. <laughs> I don't think this movie has ever been officially released with a subtitled track. Uh, there is a fan subbed version out there, and I think that's where that came from. I'm assuming that's what you yeah. have. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that's how I saw it as well. And unfortunately, so many of these movies don't have uh, an English subtitle available, but fortunately, there are enough fans out there and they have enough free time to put together a subtitle track that is fairly close, close enough. Yeah, I, I think it definitely works. I don't think we're going to really get a better one unless these start getting released by like Shout Factory or something and they do some nice cleanup and mm -hmm. put some actual subtitle work into it, you know? I know one of the Santo films uh, did get restored and there is talk about putting it... I can't remember where I read this, but there was talk about putting one of the earlier ones 
on Blu-ray, getting it completely remastered and cleaned up. And I'd be uh, surprised if they didn't do a subtitle track at the same time. That'd be great. But again, you, you talk about diminishing returns with the Mummy movies. I feel like that's what would happen with any future releases of Santo movies after that. Is, yeah. You know, they, they put a lot of money into the first one. But there's a reason why Criterion didn't do a two-disc set of <laughs> Godzilla rights again after they did Gojira. Yeah, I, I think you'd have to do 20 Santo movies all in the same set for it to... Because there can't be that many good prints of these out there. No, I can't imagine. But if you had like one or two that are nice and then a lot that are just kind of basically cleaned up, but not super great, then I feel like you could do... If you did like a six-pack of these and like three are pretty decent, I feel like you could... Get some good returns on that. I would love to know who has the rights to most of these movies. I, I'm sure some oh, of it's yeah. controlled by the families. You know, I'm sure Santos' yeah. family owns and has some stake in some of these movies. But I'd love to know who has the rights to these things. It was something I was talking about again at the theater last night with the owner. If we knew who had the rights to some of these things, we'd be playing them all the time up here. Yeah, definitely. You know, they, they have an audience uh, and not just that kind of campy. I'm going to watch it. Ironically, audience. They they yeah. have a real audience. Um, so who knows what the future of these Luchador movies are, but I would love to see more of them presented to an American audience. You know, make it for me, man. How selfish is that? But make it for me. <laughs> Put out a subtitled <laughs> version of it. Uh, clean it up. I want to see it. I want to see documentaries about these things. I want to hear a commentary track. Oh, man, that'd be amazing. But Oh, that'd be great. You know, but then I've, I'm still holding out for the soundtrack release of the Drunken Ice Cream Truck music. <laughs> 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 That'd be pretty good if somebody just put that out as an album and it was just called Drunk Ice Cream Drunk Music, <laughs> Volume 1. Okay, yeah, somebody's going to steal that idea too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you got to cut all this, man. <laughs> no, nah, man, this is gold. I love talking about these movies for people who love these movies. Uh, just, mm -hmm. It's just something about them, man. It's just something about them. I don't know what it is, but there's a magic to them. Yeah, that's the word I was just about to use is is magic. You can tell how joyful uh, everybody was making them and a lot of them, even the ones where they're kind of phoning it in. All the ideas are like first rate crazy pants ideas. And it's amazing. It's fantastic. And that's what you put on the uh, the front of the Blu-ray cover when Criterion eventually puts this out. First rate crazy pants. <laughs> Jonathan Inbody, the Ask Me Why podcast. <laughs> There's a poll quote for you. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking this movie up in the Mexican Mass Wrestler and Monster Filmography book by Bob Cotter. Uh, do you have this book? I have a lot of stuff in my Amazon wish list that I need to get to, and that's like pretty close to the top. It's it's a solid book. It's really good. Uh, he he goes through. Well, pretty much all of them. And this movie gets two entries in the book. It's not just a film guide. It, it's got some commentary and that sort of thing. And in it, uh, the author does compare the Blue Demon-Santo relationship to that of Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, where Santo is Karloff and Blue Demon is uh, Lugosi, where in most of the movies together, Karloff always got you know the high role, the, the top billing which is what happens in a lot of these movies with Santo and Blue Demon. Even in this film, yeah. in the end credits, Blue Demon's real name is revealed, which I know is known now. You can go look it up or whatever. But Santo was not billed as anybody other than Santo, the man in the silver mask. There's definitely a level of, not disrespect, but a difference in the level of respect for the two people. Like, they're both in the title, mm -hmm. but not only does Santo come first, but Santo doesn't get mind controlled and sent against Blue Demon, who is our hero. Like Santo is very clearly the one that they're focusing on. Sure, sure. And in the next movie they did together where they meet the monsters, Blue Demon and Mel Moskras do all the work. And then Santo shows up at the end and takes all the credit. I forgot that he just shows up at the end of that one and is like, yes, I've done it. Yeah, well, <laughs> to be fair, he does turn up with a flamethrower pistol. So, I mean, there's that. Yeah, that's a, if you got to show up at the end of a movie, that's a good thing to show up with. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I'm here to save the day. Nobody, <laughs> did you call Santo? I didn't call Santo. Why is he here? <laughs> yeah, there, there's just something about him that, in this world, I love the world presented by these movies, that there are mm. men walking around in these masks and it is perfectly normal. It's to be yeah. expected. 
And of course they're wearing the mask when they go scuba diving. Of course they're wearing the mask when they go out on the town after a match and they're celebrating. Uh, of course they wear the mask when they go out to dinner or, or anything else they're going to do. They've got the mask. That's who they are, which is again why I thought it was so odd that at the end of the movie, Blue Demon is billed as being played by Alejandro and I forget his last name. Yeah, that's a weird one. It was an odd, odd choice. Whereas I think in the other movies, he's just, it's Blue Demon. Yeah. But it is again the start of the santo blue demon relationship in the films so maybe that has something to do with it maybe santo pulled some strings was like hey you know i'm the star yeah. you know i'm the yeah, Karloff we gotta disrespect here. this guy in the credits <laughs> i'm the karloff he's the lugosi <laughs> i i don't know how fair of a comparison that is what are your thoughts on it i feel like it, it, it first of all it makes me like blue demon a little more because i love lugosi like i like karloff oh, but there you go. lugosi to me has has so much of my um like, I, I don't want to say that I pity him, but I, I feel so deeply for Lugosi and for what could have been if he wasn't so thoroughly underused and abused in the studio system. I don't know. I, I feel like it, it works as a comparison, but only really for the dynamic. I think it's that Blue Demon maybe felt like Santo was beloved and Blue Demon should have been beloved, where I don't think that Lugosi felt like he should have Kar- Karloff's career. Mm. But I kind of get the vibe Blue Demon feels like he should have Santo's career. Yeah, I think I think that's the best way to put it. There we go. And that's all, you know, it's all kind of putting a narrative on it, but that's just the vibe that I get. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's pretty accurate, uh, a good way to look at it because of the, the dynamic between the two, not necessarily in terms of like acting talent or what they who they were, where they came from, but the dynamic, sure. Yeah, just their careers, the differences in the careers. The, the film career. In the ring, totally yes, different. Yeah. It was its own thing. Yeah, sir. But uh, in terms of the films, yeah, I could see that. Although I got to say, I still love the Blue Demon movies. I, I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. I, and he's still my guy b- between the two. You put Mel Moscos into the mix and he's my guy. I'm a huge Mill fan, but. Yeah, I mean, the three of them, when you introduce Mel Moscos into it is when I stop being able to choose like which one is the favorite because I, I just want every movie to be the three of them. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> They're just great together. So this movie, if you can get your hands on it, track it down. Uh, you, do you have the subtitle fan track? Great, but you probably don't need it. They're pretty straightforward. Yeah, you can follow it along pretty well. Although you might be a little confused by the sequence with the guy coming in while Santos getting a little action. And like, what, what's going on? Oh, they throw him out the window. Okay. You might get a little oh, confused. Oh, and there is that bit with, with imposter Santo that might be really confusing too. At one point, there's two Santos. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a little confusing without the subtitles. <laughs> But, you know, uh, it's still so much fun. Oh, yes. Have you ever done a Luchador movie as part of the X Meets Y? I have not. The way that I kind of go about picking what goes in the list for X Meets Y is I try to pick things that are, like, emblematic or totemic of certain, like, movements and blockbusters. Okay. There's not quite a good fit for it, but I would love to do one. If you would like to be on X Meets Y sometime, we will do a Santo movie and we'll mix it with something <laughs> and that'll be a blast. Right on, man. Right on. So, if there's anything else to talk about the movie... uh throw it in there now because i think we've pretty much talked it all out (laughs) yeah i think we covered it because this one is much like this movie this conversation was very much like a to b cover it all get through it and it was a delight (laughs) yeah it was yeah it was it's it's a great film and it's always fun to talk about these kinds of things and and to have fun talking about them with people who truly and clearly love them uh as much been awesome having you back on the show man yes thank you for having me again we we definitely got to do this again soon and like i was just saying open invitation if you ever want to do x meets y we'll we'll fit it in i'm kind of scared man <laughs> it is intimidating i get it but you know i mean look i'm just saying i'm gonna i'm calling you out to all your listeners at this moment exactly so <laughs> wow well i can but you have editing power you can get rid I of this say, i can edit this if out you don't want to be called out. I, I can edit this out and be like man that guy never invites me to his podcast <laughs> oh, so terrible. <laughs> right on. So that's xmeetswy.libson.com. Listeners, check it out to hear Jonathan. And how often do you put the show out? Uh, it's out every other Wednesday. There we go. Every other week. Get a little action in your ears from Jonathan. Thanks for being part of the show. And we'll have you back on down the line. And good luck with all the writing and everything, man. Thank you so much. I, I cannot wait to be back and uh, talk about some other crazy thing. <laughs> I'll start thinking about something we can have you back on for. Something that's non-theme month. We'll, we'll come up with something. Yes. Come up with something. xmeetswide.libsyn.com. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. I'll also play the promo for that podcast here in a second. 
Big thanks to Jonathan for being part of the show. And I meant it, man. We really need to get you back on the show when we're not doing a themed month. You know, just kind of let loose. We'll find a monster movie to talk about and... I'm sure it'll be a good time just like this time was for me and hopefully the listeners. Thanks again, man. If somebody asked you to describe a movie to them, what would you say? Would you say that Guardians of the Galaxy is Star Wars meets the A-Team or that Jurassic Park is Westworld meets the Lost World? The X meets Y pitch is a long-standing Hollywood tradition, one that's been used to sell plenty of movies that otherwise probably wouldn't have been made. But instead of starting with a script and comparing it to two movie titles for an X meets Y pitch, what if we started with two movie titles and improvised the pitch? Well, on my podcast X meets Y, that's exactly what we do. I'm Jonathan Inbody, and each episode I and a guest will randomly select two movie titles, and then we have half an hour to come up with a new original movie idea that could be described as movie X meets movie Y. We've done episodes like Ocean's Eleven meets 2001 A Space Odyssey, Godzilla meets Old Yeller, and RoboCop meets Dead Poet Society. Basically, it's a half-hour sprint through a brainstorming session, and it is a lot of fun. If any of that sounds even the slightest bit fun to you, then you should give X Meets Y a listen. It's available wherever you find your podcasts, or at xmeetsy.libsyn.com. Hopefully, you'll hear my voice again very soon, but for now, enjoy the rest of your regularly scheduled podcast, you lucky so-and-so. Vampires werewolves, zombies. Yes, these things are real, but fortunately for those of us who can afford him, so is Mark Temple. And he's good. Real good. He's a former FBI agent turned freelancer with the knowledge and skills to eliminate your monster problems, and his rates are negotiable. Monster Hunter for Hire, the first volume of the Supernatural Solutions, the Mark Temple Case Files, is now available in both ebook and paperback. Go to tinyurl.com slash monsterhuntertemple to buy your copy of Derek M. Cook's latest book. Read about Mark Temple, the experienced professional now available to rid you of your supernatural ghoulish and monstrous pests. That's tinyurl.com slash monsterhuntertemple. And don't worry, Mark Temple is discreet. You'd be beautiful. I would not be beautiful. I would be a freak. No, Carl, you'll be something special. You'll be beautiful. You'll matter. These damn things don't come off. I'm half a freak now. Let me finish. You're not gonna finish nothing. Did you let me touch you for one second? You did not. What do you think I am, some kind of stupid animal or something? She was the one who set him apart, made him different, unique. The only thing of his kind, like no other man. The Illustrated Man. Where the lions live. Right there. Well, I was the one that said it. Oh, yeah, right there where the lions live, down in Africa. we do. Why the hell are we following you? You listen to me. Four of us got out of that wreckage alive. Alive! That means something. That's the big difference. That means we got a chance to survive. And there's 120 sun domes scattered over 11 continents on this stinking planet. And if we find one, one sun dome, we've made it. We came through. We survived. She was the one who sent him out on the strangest odyssey ever ventured to explore the ends of the universe, to travel to the end of time. And through it all, he carries one all-consuming goal. 
and I'm looking for the lady that lives in it. And when I find her, That brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. Big thanks for being part of the show this time around. I hope you enjoyed the conversation that we had with Jonathan. I hope you dug the segments. You know, we don't have a Weird Wednesday this week, but that's because Jeff Pullier keeps showing up at Weird Wednesday when I'm there, and we end up recording live at the Joy Cinema. Well, I guess it's not really live, but, you know, I'm recording it, and he's not really calling in the Weird... He's not calling in the Weird Wednesdays because we're actually recording it on location. But I haven't played some of those here, and that's because I'm storing them up. I'm, I'm holding on to them, and at some point, I'm going to put out an episode of all the Weird Wednesday recordings. Probably as we get closer to Monster Bash is when I'm going to do that, because I'm going to be spending a lot of time getting ready for Monster Bash. I have a checklist I'm going through now. I know it's, uh, wow, a month away, and uh, I have a lot to get done up to and including making sure I've got my hotel room taken care of, which is why I've got so many things listed on eBay right now. I'll make sure there's a link to my eBay page as well. And you know, Jonathan and I mentioned the movie Neon Maniacs in our conversation. I think by the time this episode goes out, my original one sheet of that movie will be for sale on eBay. So if you're a Neon Maniacs fan, there you go. Or if you just want to help me out, there you go. You know, I've got some feedback sitting here. I'm going to hold on to it until next week. I know I said last time around that if you want to hear Brenda on the show, you got to send something in because that's how she gets involved. But this has been a pretty rough week for her leading up to today. I mean, she's doing better today, but the weekend was a wash and yesterday was just, uh, anyway, I've got some email waiting for her for when she joins us here on the show, which will probably be next week. So if you have any email that you want to make sure it gets read in next week's show, email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com or give me a call and leave me a voicemail at 503-479-5657. That's 503-4795-MKR. You can find all of this on our website. That's monsterkidradio.net. Please check out the show notes for links to everything that we talked about here. Professor Frenzy, Dr. Tongue's represented there. Every book that you've heard us talk about here on the show that vault of horror collection my book monster hunter for hire it's all there as well just follow the amazon links to buy those and we get a cent or two because we're an amazon affiliate and it helps us out every little bit helps out the show you know what i mean it makes it better now we do have a patreon campaign and i need to send a message out to all the patrons but i'm going to do it publicly here too at least a little bit and just let you guys and gals know that i'm going to have to revamp it again because i just cannot keep up with the commitment that i am constantly making with the patreon campaign i i am so sorry about that we're going to get this figured out and i understand that if you need to change your patronage levels because of that it, it's totally understandable i totally get it Please bear with me. And again, thanks for your patience. Also on our website, you will find links to our Twitter page, our Facebook page, our Facebook group. We've got it all there, as well as all the previous episodes, including the episode I released over the past weekend, announcing the new round of the Monster Movie Madness Tournament, which I think I labeled round three, but it's really round four. So just go back to Sunday's episode to hear Steve Turk and I talk about that. The deadline for that round is this Sunday. May 26th. We've got one more week in Lucia de Mayo, and we're going to be talking with, well, somebody you've been hearing all month here on the show. Kenny is going to be here. Kenny Blows is going to be here to talk about a Blue Demon movie called Hellish Spiders. This one, oh, this one made me all tingly. I loved it. It was a lot of fun, but I don't want to spoil the conversation too much. You're going to have to come back in seven days to hear us chat about this 1968 gem of a film. So much fun. So come back for that. And what's happening in June? Well, Monster Bash is going to be hitting soon, but we've got a few other episodes in the can already just waiting to put out there in the Monster Kid radio feed for when we kind of get back to normal and aren't just doing luchador monster movies. we got some other non-luchador monster movies waiting for us. So keep listening. Don't change that Monster Kid dial. Or channel or something. 
Anyway, Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Froiling in Tajikistan. That belongs to the band Beach Masters of the Universe. It is from their album Tropica. They are a surf band based out of Hamburg, Germany. And yeah, you can go ahead and laugh at me about how I probably butchered the German pronunciation of the name of the song. But the song is really really cool as is the entire album which you can pick up through Bandcamp for seven euros it's a deal check it out and let them know that monster kid radio sent you my name is Derek m cook talk to everybody next week for one more round of lucha de mayo at least for this year adios <laughs>